cultivation of science and he will be telling us about non equilibrium dynamics of closed quantum system systems a tale of two stories okay um, good morning everybody and uh, i'd like to begin by thanking the organizers for inviting me here uh, so this talk is going to be uh, about two aspects of non equilibrium <coughs> dynamics of closed quantum systems and uh, it's really a collection of two talks so first let me acknowledge my collaborators so um, um, joydeep um, Sau, who is in the University of Maryland, um, and Adolfo Del Campo, who is at, who just got a job at UMass Boston, and both of them are involved in the first part of the work, and uh, and so is Uma Divakaran, who was in IIT Kanpur and now in CBS Mumbai. So the second part of work of this work, which is uh, based on work distribution and work statistics, uh, is done with uh, my student Anirban Dutta. And my colleague uh, Arnab Dash at the at Cultivation. Arnab is here at the audience. Uh, and uh, so uh, the first part of the talk is going to be uh, a story of two rate dynamics. In other words, what happens when we drive not one but two parameters of the system as a function of time. So what I'm going to uh, sort of argue that this could be a method for excitation suppression during dynamics in a quantum system. Uh, so, uh, first I'm going to have a brief review on other methods of excitation suppression which is, uh, uh, which are available uh, and then uh, talk, uh, give a brief introduction to kribel zurek scaling and then show that this two rate drive um, uh, via an exact solution of an integrable, a class of integrable model like the Ising and the Kitab, that this two rate drives provides a generalization of this kribel zurek scaling and to, and also at the same go, it gives you a suppression of defect when you go through a quantum critical system. So then I'm going to present the general arguments uh, for non-integrable <coughs> models and end with some concluding remarks. So, uh, so non-adiabatic drive protocols, uh, you know, when we drive a system through a quantum critical point or even otherwise, they almost invariably lead to production of excitations leading to finite density of defects and uh, extra residual energy. For RAM dynamics, for example, which takes the system from one phase to another through an intermediate critical point, there is this celebrated kibel zurek law which tells you that the defect density or the excitation density and the residual energy would scale with some universal exponent um, um, with the uh, drive frequency. Now, this is theoretically a beautiful result, but the point is that such an increase leads to inevitable loss of fidelity when one tries to reach a targeted quantum state. So imagine that you start from a given state and you want to reach some state by dynamics uh, by changing some parameter of your Hamiltonian. And unless you need to spend all the time in the world in doing that, you need to be non-adiabatic. But however, if you are non-adiabatic, um, you really cannot reach that state because there is a loss of fidelity in the process. Um, uh, due to this excitation production. So this leads to loss of control in quantum state preparation. Okay. So this is a big challenge in um, uh, how adiabatic can you go without being too slow. You know, in, uh, so, so one way to avoid this problem is to use adiabatic or near adiabatic protocols. Uh, of course, this, as I said, this is impractical and also, you know, it's sometimes impossible because if you have a gapless point or a gapless system where you are trying to make these changes, you can never be adiabatic, right? I mean, you are always, uh, so there is always some excitations. So the question that comes is, is there a shortcut to adiabaticity where near adiabaticity can, or at least near adiabaticity can be achieved in a finite time? If so, how fast can it be done? Okay. So these are the questions that one tries to answer. And one of the, oops, sorry, what did I do? So one of the proposals uh, in this field was uh, uh, first was suggested by Barry, uh, who said that, uh, whose idea was the following. So imagine that you have a um, system Hamiltonian, which is some H naught of T, okay, and the instantaneous Eigen state one of the instantaneous eigenstate at time t is just m. Okay, so this is the relation. Now, imagine that you wanted to do some state preparation where your target state is this psi n, which is what the state n would evolve to if the dynamics was adiabatic. Now, of course, for a generic Hamiltonian, the dynamics is not adiabatic, 
and Berry's idea was to design a H1 so that the adiabatic approximation to the dynamics of H0 becomes the exact solution for the dynamics of HT. Okay. So, so you add a Hamiltonian term H1 so that you know this Schrodinger equation is satisfied. Okay. Now, uh, and starting from here and knowing the instantaneous eigenvalues and eigenvectors of H0, one can uh, show that uh, H1t is given in terms of uh, this matrix element. So, time derivative of H matrix element of time derivative of H0 t between the two eigenstates m and n divided by their instantaneous energy difference and uh, that is the expression. Okay. So, the point is that uh, of course, this makes the thing adiabatic, but uh, at, the, at the first uh, go, I mean it is uh, sort of this expression is a little bit misleading. I just want to point out the computational difficulty that is involved in calculating this thing. You need to know the instantaneous eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this time dependent Hamiltonian at every instant. Okay. And that is not an easy task, that is out of the question for standard non integrable models. Even for integrable models, it is sometimes difficult. Uh, however, if you take a simple enough system like the two level system, it is possible to uh, you know uh, look into this. So, H 1 t is basically given by the time derivative of uh, the time dependent parameter times this delta which is the off diagonal term divided by the instantaneous energy. Uh, this is really the instantaneous energy gap between the ground state and the excited state of the two level system and then there is the sigma y matrix. So, uh, once one knows this, one can directly apply this to a class of integrable models, Ising, XY, and Kita, if, uh, since they reduce to a collection of two level system for each momentum pair. Okay? And this is done by some Jordan Wigner transformation, which I am going to come to in a later part of the talk. But say this can be done, and uh, the 1D Ising model in this representation can be written in the following form uh, there is an exact expression for this uh, quantity. Now, this H1, although this is exact, and it has a reasonably simple expression in terms of the fermionic representation of the uh, Ising spins, H1 takes a very complicated form in spin space, leading to multiple terms. So, in an experimental point of view, when you are given an Ising model, what you need is to design terms which contain uh, multiple, uh, multiple spin correlations. Okay. So, the strategy that um, Adolfo and his co and Zurek and others who were working on this uh, Hamiltonian took is that they kept a few of these and check that as one increased the number of these multiple spin correlations, how does the excitation density uh, change? And they show that uh, you know so these curves are all for when you keep more and more terms in the Hamiltonian and more and more of these multiple spin terms and uh, there is a reduction of the defect density and after a few of these probably when you keep of the order of 30 terms or so, uh, it is really as close to 0 as you can get. Okay. Uh, the problem with this uh, method uh, is that complication in computation of H 1 t which is really formidable for non integrable systems and that experimental implementation because experimentally whenever you want to implement this H 1 t you need to really do strange things with your lasers if you are doing uh, things with ultra cold atoms or otherwise. Uh, it is not very easy. Okay, so, that is the point. So, this uh, protocol uh, is very nice formally, but it is not very easy to experimentally implement it. The second uh, set of stuff which people talk about is goes under the name of optimal control method. So, what they do is that they consider a generic Hamiltonian which is of this form where this H i are some local operators and lambda is are dimensionless couplings. H i has dimensions of energy. So, what they do is to consider a ground state of the system corresponding to some values of this parameters lambda i and uh, imagine that you want to access this other some other ground state psi 2 which is the ground state of lambda for some final values of these parameters. Okay. And in between we change lambda as a function of time. And the question that one asks is that what is the given protocol for which if we go from psi of t i to psi of t f at the end of the time evolution, uh, we will have maximum overlap between the two ground states. 
In other words, they minimize a cost function, which is given by 1 minus the over wave function over left square, and, uh, and try to find out a protocol for which this cost function is minimal. And this is done typically by taking this time dependent protocol, breaking it down, it down into discrete time steps. And so, so that within each time step, you can describe the evolution according to some constant piece. And then it's an optimization problem where you minimize with respect to all those constant pieces you know, in the time interval. And as you make these time intervals finer and finer, uh, you sort of converge to a result. The second thing that one asks in each of these protocols is that how fast one can reach the final state. Uh, and in this, there is a universal limit called the quantum speed limit. This doesn't apply to a cops giving you a ticket when you are driving, but uh, still there is a speed limit. And it turns out that when you reach from a given state to some other given state, uh, what the time taken to do that is uh, primarily, I mean, controlled by the uncertainty, energy time uncertainty relation. Okay. So, uh, however, if you sort of do a much more careful job, it turns out it depends on the maximum of the time average energy or the time average energy variance, whichever is, uh, you know, whichever gives you the larger value, times the sine square of an angle, which is known as the uh, Bure's length, which is a measure of the distance between the state you start with and the state you want to reach in the Hilbert space. Okay. So, uh, so, one, so this is a straightforward calculation which was done by Defner and Lutz at some point. There are many versions of this uh, time bound which exist in the literature, but all of them are roughly equivalent uh, up to some factors of order one factors. Uh, but so the thing is that, of course, this optimal control protocol and approaching the quantum speed limit are theoretically uh, interesting concepts. but both numerical calculation and experimental implementation of this optimal protocol for a generic many body system remains a challenge. And you can understand that, you know, evaluating the final state and stuff like that exactly for a non integral model is a challenge. One does things approximately, but then again, I mean, you know, experimental impl implementation is also a tricky thing. And also, convergence of this optimization procedure is another issue, and it's not always guaranteed that you are going to have a convergence. So, uh, so uh, this uh, what I'm going to tell you about is this two-rate protocol, where you vary two parameters of your system as a function of time in a straightforward manner. And what we want to show is that this leads to excitation suppression. Now, of course, this is not optimal, but uh, but it, the advantage of this is that it's experimentally quite easily implementable. So before that, let me just go through, uh, refresh your memory about this uh, argument about kibel zurek scaling. So the idea is that if you take a quantum system uh, through some critical point by varying a parameter, by one of its parameters as a function of time, the system enters the so-called impulse region where the ground state cannot follow the uh, change in the Hamiltonian. I mean, the system cannot remain in the ground state anymore. Okay? So away from the critical point where there is a big gap, uh, in spite of the presence of this time, dif time dependent parameter, you are in the adiabatic regime in both sides of it. But in between, there is an impulse regime. And this approximation lies in the fact by stating that all the excitation production takes place in this impulse regime. Now, if you are driving it slowly, then this impulse regime is also the critical regime, and there uh, the scaling theory for this, uh, I mean, you know, scaling holds, essentially. So uh, this impulse regime uh, is reached by the system when uh, the rate of change of the gap, the energy gap, instantaneous energy gap, is same order as the square of the gap. Okay. That's just the Landau criteria for uh, being non-adiabatic. And once we put this uh, thing, uh, so if the system is in the scaling regime in the uh, is it scaling regime in the impulse region, then I can I know what this energy gap looks like. It goes as lambda to the power z nu by t by tau to the power z nu, where this lambda is the parameter that you vary, and uh, the and as you know that the energy gap always varies as lambda to the power z nu near the critical point, where lambda is the parameter that one changes to reference the critical point. So if I put this in, in this equation, and solve for t, I find out the time spent by the system in the impulse region. 
and that is given by uh, the quench time to the power some z nu by z nu plus 1. So, in this, so if I put this back in this expression for t, what I find that the energy gap scales with the uh, drive time as tau to the power minus z nu by z nu plus 1. And now, with this one can find out the number of excitation, because the number of excitation is produced around the critical point within a phase space which goes as k to the power d, which means that it goes as delta to the power d over z, and which means that it uh, goes as tau to the power nu d by z nu plus 1. Okay. This was what Anatoly essentially argued in his first paper in 2005, but a similar argument was also given by Damsky, Zurek and all others, and it has a long history. Okay. But this argument tells you that there is a universal scaling of the number of excitations for any quantum system as you go through the critical point. Now, let us, so this is when one of the system parameters is varied with respect to time. Now, let us go to this two uh, rate protocol. So, what I am going to take is a standard, a class of model which is represented by free fermions, uh, which is two level fermions out uh, there. Now, this calls concrete examples, 1 d x y in a transverse field for example, where uh, this is the parameters which uh, correspond. So, lambda 1, b k and tau 2 can be interpreted in terms of j x, j y and h, which are the standard parameters of the x y model. And uh, the instantaneous energy gap from here uh, goes as this, and now the difference is that the off diagonal term also varies as a function of time. So, in this representation, this is not a Kibble uh, Landau Zener problem anymore. Uh, so, one needs to do a little bit more. So, the system reaches a critical point at t equal to t naught, and that happens when uh, g k is equal to 0 from for some k equal to k naught, and b k naught is equal to lambda 1 at lambda 1 of t naught. Okay. So, that is the time and that is the momentum value for which the system reaches the critical point, the gapless point. So, in what follows, we shall assume that this b k naught is not equal to 0, and g k goes linearly around that gapless point. So, it turns out that there is an exact solution for this in the linear dynamics. And uh, the way to see this is that, uh, okay, I am not going to go through the details of the math, but the point is that you can make a unitary transformation and go to a frame where you can transfer all the time dependence as long as you are driving it linearly to the diagonal term. And this is done by the following transformation. So, you think of this different Pauli matrices and these are the relations. Okay. So, never mind this complicated relation, but the point is that the basic observation is that there exists a transformation which shifts all the time dependence of the Hamiltonian to the diagonal term and reduces it to an effective Landau Zener problem for each momentum. And then we can, uh, so once we understand this, we can sort of go back to this, um, you know, the old uh, stuff in the literature and just say, read off the probability. The probability would be given from here by. Uh, uh, the standard kibel zurek law, which turns out to be this. Okay. So, this lambda 2 k square is the off diagonal matrix element square, and this is to be divided by the rate at which the energy changes, which is given by this lambda 1 k. Okay. And uh, the defect density then is given by the momentum integral of this p of k. The point is that there is a scaling regime. So, when each of the drive rates by this quantity b k naught square is less than 1, and if omega 2 over omega 1 is large compared to square root of omega 1 over b k naught, then it turns out that this complicated expression that one had out here simplifies us quite a bit. Okay. And it turns out that one can write this expression as something like this. Okay. Some c is some constant, non-universal constant by the way but then you have omega 2 square k square by omega 1 cube. So, you see that both the drive rates omega 2 and omega 1, the off diagonal drive rates which takes the system, uh, which uh, sort of changes the off diagonal term and uh, the diagonal drive rate enters this probability. And now, uh, once you have this form of p k, you can simply obtain the results for n by a rescaling, which is this and n uh, scales as omega 1 to the power 3 d by 2 by omega uh, times omega 2 to the power minus t. So, here is the first result that once um, you have this drive, the larger you drive the off diagonal term, the less defects are produced. Okay. So, there is a defect suppression which goes as omega 2 to the power minus t. 
Now, this also this result is a generalization of Hebel's Zurek scaling to two rate protocols, and I'm come back. I'll come back to this in a much um, um, a much general way uh, in the later part of the talk. Now, this excitation and defect production is suppressed. So here you see that this not only happens in the scaling regime, but also for the general case where I plot this n as a function of omega, uh, as a fun okay, I can't see this omega two for different omega ones, and you see that the, there is a generic suppression of excitation density as you increase omega 2. Uh, so, this could act as a possible protocol for shortcut to adiabaticity and I would like to point out at the outset that this is not an optimal protocol, okay. but something which is probably experimentally a little more easily implementable. Now, the other interesting thing in this is that there is a crossover. So, uh, we could look into what happens to n and q in the scaling regime when both the rates are increased keeping a fixed ratio between them. So, I put omega 2 to be omega 1 to the power r. So, here because and it is really easy to see from here that since these two scales with some different power there is a crossover regime. So, if r is greater than 3 by 2 then uh, of course, uh, you know this omega 2 wins and there is a defect suppression as a function of um, omega, whereas if r is less than 3 by 2, then omega 1 wins and there is a defect increase. In between, exactly at r equal to 3 by 2, the defect, uh, the excitation production become independent of both the drive rates and you have a universal but system dependent, I mean not universal but system dependent constant which gives you this defect rate. So, uh, so, n and q can either decrease as a function of this drive provided you fix the ratio. Okay. So, um, so, this shows that for a class of generic model, you can achieve this defect suppression pretty easily by driving the coefficient of the off diagonal term. However, how does it relate to you know the generic systems where you do not have this 2 by 2 description or you do not have an exact solution. And this can be done by applying to a simple scaling argument. Uh, so, let us consider a generic time dependent Hamiltonian driven with a protocol which involves two rates. The first one of this is controls the proximity of the system to a quantum critical point which occurs at lambda c and this is controlled by the rate omega 1. So, the system enters this um, critical uh, point at t naught which is lambda c over omega 1. The second drive parameter which is the main thing here. Uh, controls the dispersion of the quasi particle at the quantum critical point. So, it is the velocity of the quasi particles which is driven as a function of time. Okay. And then uh, of course, the uh, at the critical point the energy gap now becomes some c of t times k to the power z and this c of t now becomes an arbitrary uh, now becomes a function of time with an exponent beta. Okay. So, now so for the part that we did earlier what we did was to set alpha and beta to be 1, but now it is generic uh, drive. Okay. So, how do we now proceed? So, again we appeal to this Landau criteria, so that the defects are produced in the impulse region where the state of the system cannot follow the Hamiltonian anymore. So, that is given by d delta d t of the order of delta square. So, we put this value of delta and solve just like the old Kibel Zurich argument and we find that the time spent by the system in the critical point is uh, given by this, okay, where t naught is lambda c by omega 1, that is the time at which the system enters the critical point. Uh, at the, okay, so, at the critical point, so we substitute this t minus t naught back in the expression of uh, t and we find that just as in the old kibel zurek mechanism, delta scales as omega 1 to the power alpha z nu by alpha z nu plus 1. Okay. So, this is the standard kibel zurek result. Okay. Uh, provided I you set alpha to 1 for linear drive, but this can be sort of easily generalized to nonlinear drives and stuff like that. Now comes the main point. The, so, now we have to think about the excitation production around this critical point. The available phase space is still k to the power d, but now k is related to delta by this quantity where this is c of t and I have replaced this c where c of t was the yeah, where c of t was this, the velocity, time dependent velocity and I replace time by t equal to t naught, the point at which the system uh, approaches, uh, uh, enters the critical uh, point. Now, this is done because anything, uh, any, so typically we should really put capital T and not capital T naught out there, 
But this difference only gives rise to subleading terms, which is not important for the scaling relation which we are trying to derive. Okay, so uh, apparently, so if you do this, then you find that uh, this T naught, since it depends on uh, lambda c over omega one, and depends on omega two, it gives you an extra factor, which was not there in the single parameter drive. And then, of course, you know this k goes as that, and k to the power d is your m. So you have a relation which tells you that your defect would be suppressed according to the power minus beta d over z where beta is the rate at which, I mean the nonlinearity with which you basically drive uh, the off diagonal term. And you, so two things to note here. One is that if I put beta equal to zero, which means that I put in a constant uh, this thing, uh, constant um, off diagonal term, I get back the old Kibel Zurich result. Okay. So this is a generic, uh, uh, so this is the generalization of the old Kibel Zurich stuff and it also shows you that there is defect suppression out here. So the crossover behavior now occurs when you equate these two powers and find that there is a R, R star, which is one plus alpha z nu by beta times alpha z nu plus one. And this reduces to three by two if you put alpha z nu beta everything to one. Okay. So, uh, so there is a genetic result. Okay. Now uh, the real question out here is that suppose we have a protocol like this how do we put it into a realistic system? I mean, uh, you know, quasi-particle dispersions at the critical point and parameter tuned to near the critical point, these are all very nice concepts, but how do you relate it to a microscopic, param uh, microscopic parameters of the Hamiltonian? Because uh, at the end of the day, all you have, uh, which you can experimentally tune are microscopic parameters of a given Hamiltonian. Now, of course, there is no generic answer to that question, but we at least took one, um, uh, Hamilton, one model, which is a non-integrable model, which is realized in experiment in uh, um, in um, standard uh, cold, cold atom experiments, and showed that this defect suppression actually works in that um, model. So uh, that model is this Boson's tilted optical lattice. So what you do is to apply an effective electric field, which is done either by shifting the trap center of the Boson's, so that you know, because it's a parabolic trap, if you shift its center, it's like a linear term which acts as an effective electric field for the bosons. Or if these are spinner bosons with polarized spins, you can apply a Zeeman term which is linearly dependent in space. So either way, you generate this electric field, and then in the presence of a lattice, you have a tilted lattice out there. So uh, Subir and I, during my postdoc days at Yale, worked on this quite a bit, and uh, apparently it turns out that this system of bosons to describe their effective low energy theory, one can appeal to a dipole model, where this dipole is a connection of, uh, dipole is a bound state of this uh, and boson and a hole in neighboring sites. Okay. So whereas this is the mod site, a dipole would be a hole in here and an extra particle in there. Okay. It's a bound state of that. So and it turns out, and for reasons I'm not going to get into the details of that in this talk, uh, this apparently describes the low energy uh, excitation. So the thing to note is that this dipole, it's, it's not a Hamiltonian which conserves the dipole number, and this is because that there can always be the stray quantum fluctuations which would make one boson to hop from a given site to the next, and that's going to change your dipole number. That's the hopping term out here. And also to create a dipole, you pay an energy cost which is u minus e, because you can see this because if I have a boson out here and it goes and sit here, it gains an energy E because there is an electric field, but it pays an extra energy cost E. So the dipole creation energy is just U minus E. And uh, so, so essentially this dipole model has been studied in different equilibrium and non-equilibrium context. What arises out of this is that this dipole model uh, kind of gives you two phases, one in which the electric field is much stronger than the interaction. And in this case, of course, um, so u minus e is negative, and so the ground state corresponds to the maximum number of dipoles out here. Whereas uh, if u minus e is positive, that is the electric field is small compared to the on-site interaction, then it's just the standard uh, mod phase with no dipoles. Okay, so this is the dipole vacuum, and this is the maximal dipoles. And in between, there is an Ising quantum phase transition, which occurs at a critical value of the electric field which turns out to be u plus some extra uh, value of j. 
So E has to be just a little bit more than U because it also needs to kill the quantum fluctuations that comes from J. Okay. Uh, so this is the experimental realization of this. This was in, uh, um, I think, Greiner's group in Harvard. And so they sort of looked at it in a spin language and they found out that um, they actually see this phase and they sold this work sort of <laughs> as the experimental realization of effective Ising model in ultra cold atoms, okay, which is nice. Uh, but I mean, there is one point that I need to mention is that although this model has a very rich phase diagram out here in terms of the spin language, but the actual experiment and this dipole model can be done in this blue region, you know, where there is this uh, blue stuff. Okay. But what I now want to do is to take this dipole model and uh, study it by two red protocol, where I vary, uh, where I think of varying the electric field, which can be done by varying the tilted magnet, the magnetic field, which gives the tilt, and uh, the hopping, you know, which can be varied by controlling the depth of the optical lattice. So the ramp starts at t equal to 0 and continues till some finite time until we reach the critical point. Okay? And this is sort of how you go in the u and, uh, sorry, e and j space where uh, you go. Uh, and the point is that, so it takes a time tc for the system to reach the critical point. And it turns out that where, so this you can solve and get this, where omega naught depends on uh, the amount by which you change your E and the amount by which you change your J, delta E and delta J, and the rates omega 1 and omega 2. And you see that for Tc to be greater than 0, it turns out that omega naught has to be greater than 0, which means that there is a critical ratio of omega 2 over omega 1, and that above which the system does not reach the critical point. I mean, if you drive it too fast, this slope is going to be almost parallel to the critical line and you are never going to reach it. So the method that we used for this is that we used exact diagonalization to compute all the eigenstates and eigenvalues of h at t equal to 0. And then expand the wave function, expanded the wave function in this basis and wrote down the Schrodinger equation for, um, uh, for this wave function in terms of this coefficient c, c prime. And uh, then one can show that this is the Schrodinger equation and this lambda 1 and lambda 2 are simply the matrix element of the dipole number operator and the dipole creation and destruction operator uh, between the states alpha and beta of the original uh, EB. And once we found this c alpha, we can, we know the wave function and therefore we can compute any expectation value. And what we choose to compute is the basically the uh, dipole d density difference, which means the difference in dipole density from the uh, instantaneous state with the instantaneous ground state. Okay. So, uh, so we do this. So what is the theoretical expectation? What do we really expect? So if we look into this problem, I mean, uh, the instantaneous quasi-particle gap in the impulse region depends on u minus e and a linear term in j which I can write is a sum omega naught minus t minus tc. And this is at t equal to tc, this gap vanishes because the system reaches the critical point. Now, what is the velocity of quasi-particle at the critical point? Now, this is a little more difficult because uh, the dipole model actually do not have a nearest neighbor hopping like the other models because it does not conserve, uh, okay, but go. yeah. So, it does not have a nearest neighbor hopping like the Boson model because it does not conserve the dipole number. But if you do second order perturbation theory, you generate a, a nearest neighbor hopping out of this, which goes as j square by u minus e. So near the critical point, an estimate, and this is not an exact thing, an estimate of um, the velocity goes as j square over u minus e. But near the critical point, you know, this u minus e is of the order j, so this goes as j to the power tc, which goes as omega 2 over omega naught. So knowing that this velocity goes as omega 2 over omega naught and that delta t goes as omega naught, we can simply uh, use this old ideas of scaling that I developed uh, a little bit earlier and find that this d goes as omega naught to the power 3 by 2 divided by omega, omega 2. And this minus 1 comes because we are in one dimension now. This is a one dimensional dipole. Okay. Now omega naught is of course not omega 1, but uh, provided that your change in delta E is large compared to your change in delta J, 
this nu naught can be really small and therefore in that case your dipole density is just controlled by your experimental frequencies yeah no no uh, so you don't reach the critical point actually so there is a critical omega 2 above which for a given omega 1 of course there is a critical ratio above which you don't reach the critical point you see what happens is you are kind of changing two parameters. So, in the parameter space, you need to reach that critical point and with a larger omega 2, you simply do not reach that uh, critical point. Okay. So, uh, so, then of course, this should give you back the results of the scaling theory and this is something that we checked and here is the crossover phenomenon and this is done for n equal to 16 sites and using exact diagonalization. And we find that at 1.5, we really, we really see this crossover phenomenon exactly as the theory predicts. And then there is this, the issue of scaling with, of log d with omega. And we find that there is a small region of drive frequency where the scaling is linear. But apart from that, it is not linear anymore. And that is only to be expected because you are did working with a finite size system. And so, scaling regime is only a regime of uh, drive. Okay. So, it is uh, it's not in the entire region of drive that scaling works. As you increase your system size, this regime where scaling works keeps on increasing. And uh, so, within this we find that at least for this particular non-integrable model where we can do an exact calculation, we can show that this defect suppression works. Now, it remains a question that for other generic model, you know, how exactly you would do this. So, let me conclude this part of the talk. Uh, so, what we did is to show that a two parameter drive protocol provides a way of suppressing defects on a passage to a quantum critical point. This provides an alternative route, alternative route to shortcut to adiabaticity and could thus be relevant for quantum state preparation. It is a method, I mean, and you know, whether or not it is experimentally easily implementable, that is something uh, for the future. The method avoids modifying the original Hamiltonian of the system in significant way, in contrast to Berry's proposal and in principle could have easy experimental implication. So, the method is general because almost all quantum systems in the critical regime is described by a landau Huygensberg of this form. And what we are doing here amounts to tuning not only the mass of this landau Huygensberg actional, but also the quasi-particle dispersion. And uh, this method also provides a generalization of uh, kibble zurek scaling to two parameter drives for protocols. Okay. So, that is the first part of the talk and uh, basically I can take any questions uh, for the first part if there are any or I could go to the second part. Okay, if there are no questions, I would just go to the, how much time do I have? Oh, 20 minutes, okay, good. Yeah, no, I am fine, I, I think I will finish. So, the second part of the work is on a slightly different subject which pertains to statistics of periodically driven closed quantum systems. So, uh, the point is, so here is the outline of the talk and I am going to introduce something called the large deviation principle and then talk about some general results which re relates. So, the main point of this work is to relate the statistics of word distribution uh, of a periodically driven closed quantum system after a drive period to the excitation density and residual energy produced during the drive. So, we just want to show that this relation exists. And the second thing that we want to do is that for a class of integrable system, again this Ising, Kitaev and those kind of models, it turns out that P of W is shaped by a quantum interference phenomenon known as the Stuckelberg interference. So, these are the two things that I want to just point out. So, let me try to begin with some uh, introduction to the statistics of work distribution. So, just consider a closed uh, quantum system with a time dependent Hamiltonian H naught and so that the dynamic starts at t equal to 0 for which the Hamiltonian is H naught and these are the eigenstates and it ends at t equal to tau where uh, the Hamiltonian is H 1 and these are the eigenstates and eigenenergies. So, the statistics of work distribution then tells you that uh, the probability of doing a work W is uh, a product of two things. First is that if you start from a given state alpha in the original Hamiltonian, you reach a given state beta of the final Hamiltonian and then W must equal to the, uh, it must be equal to the energy difference between these two states. Okay. Now, P alpha beta is the, uh, is of course this probability and this can be split into two parts. One is that the system starts in a given state alpha 
which in a thermal ensemble is just e to the power minus beta e alpha by z naught, where z naught is the partition function. And then the conditional probability that given that the system starts in a given state alpha, it reaches a state beta after the dynamics, which is, the, which is given by alpha s beta mod square, where s is the time evolution operator. Okay. So this is the generic uh, definition of uh, work distribution. Uh, so if you put in all of this, then that's what happens. Okay. So, uh, so one thing that one appreciates is that this is challenging because you need to sum over alpha and beta, and even at zero temperature, where the sum over alpha is just replaced by uh, the the ground state configure, so alpha just becomes the ground state. Then uh, you do need to sum over all beta, which is the full scale of st full range of states of the final Hamiltonian. Okay, and this is not very easy. So typical, and also there is this delta function. So essentially working with PW is difficult. So what typically people do is to compute the Fourier transform of PW, with, which is known as the work distribution. Okay. And uh, this is given, uh, which is known as the, sorry, characteristic function, G of t, which is given by that. And this can be reduced to a form where you need to evaluate the stress and you need to know the initial density matrix. But uh, you don't really need to have um, the reference to uh, the excited states. However, it's not a very easy task either because you have exponential of Hamiltonian apparatus sitting here, and a straightforward evaluation of this is really very difficult. So the only thing that I want to point out is that this characteristic function, or more properly, the complex conjugate of this, is often called as the Lakshmi Tico in the literature. Okay, but. Uh, I'm going to take a different route. Instead of taking the uh, Fourier transform, I'm going to talk about the Laplace transform of the work distribution. And there is a reason. So what happens is that in a generic closed quantum systems, this P of W essentially um, is expected to sort of satisfy this large deviation principle, which tells that the deviation of P of W from the most probable value of the work, which is the average work, goes in the following form where this IW is called the rate function, okay, which vanishes at the average work, uh, when W equals the average work. So direct computation of, so if this large division from is satisfied, then this direct, com so IW tells you everything about the work distribution. However, its direct computation is complicated because PW has delta functions and you, know, you really need to regulate it properly. It's much easier to compute its generating functional, G of U, which is just the Laplace transform of this P of W. Okay. And then finally, and this is the last bit of mathematics that I'm going to kind of appeal to, is there is some theorem called the gartner ellis theorem, which tells that if G of U has the same form as, uh, as the form exponential minus LD of FU, where FU is a concave function and is differentiable for all U, if these conditions are satisfied, then P of W will satisfy large deviation principle. That's one thing. And the second thing is that the rate function i of w and this f is related by the following relation, where u of w bar out here is just the solution of f prime equal to w bar, uh, and w bar is the average work done. It's, it's uh, w by n. Okay. Uh, so and n, of course, is the number of constituent degrees of freedom, particles, spins, whatever you want to put in here. So now I am in a position to state our results. So what we have shown is that for any generic, uh, no, n is not, it's the number of particles. So if you have sides, then n is same as L to the power d modulo dimension uh, issues. But, uh, but both, are supposed to be both are supposed to be large for this. I mean, uh, if the system is. So for any generic closed periodic uh, drive, a periodically driven quantum system, PW obeys a large deviation principle. That's the first thing that we showed. That is, what we showed is that this function, we computed this function f and showed that it's concave. And the second thing is that the corresponding rate function IW has the following thing. So I of 0 is greater than or equal to ND, and I of Q, where Q is the residual energy, is equal to 0. Okay. So these are the main results. And so let me just quickly sketch this for you, because I don't have much time. So let's start with the expression of P of W out here, which I have already shown. And now that I have a periodic drive and I look at, a, look at the system at the end of a drive period, I have only one set of eigenvalues and eigenfunctions, which is h at lambda 0, because lambda f is now same as lambda 0. Okay. 
So the probability of the system reaching a state alpha at the end of the drive cycle is P02 alpha, which is just this. Okay, because I am now at zero temperature and I am st always starting from the ground state. Okay. So this is the time evolution operator. Now this, so the major observation is that these probabilities can be expressed in terms of wave function overlap of the final state with the eigenstate alpha. So this is easy to, so it's a state and I can always expand it in a given basis, which I choose to be this uh, particular basis. And of course, mod C alpha square is one. So P02 alpha is simply mod C alpha square. So once we understand this and we put this here, we can take the Laplace transform, that's easy. Because of this delta function, you can just write it there. And this, then this G of U, which is the uh, Laplace transform of the work distribution, attains this form. Okay. So note that this C naught square doesn't ha is independent of U. The term with the C naught square is independent of U, and this happens only because you are looking at the system at the end of a periodic drive. Okay. If the two ground states were different, then there would be a ground state energy times U out here, difference of ground state energy, which which is not there for a periodic drive. So from here, F of U is just the log of G of U um, times some minus L to the power D. And now I want to show that f of u is a concave function. Now to do that, what we need to do is that first evaluate f of 0. Now f of 0 by definition is 0 because you know if you put 0 here, you just found mod c alpha square, which is 1 and that's that. And then f of infinity is a number which is positive definite. So f of u is certainly an increasing function. Now the only question is that whether you know this, uh, where this derivative vanishes and whether I mean, the second derivative is negative and stuff like that. But you can actually show all those. Oops, sorry. You can show all those and show that f is a concave function. And therefore, uh, from here, one can conclude that the probability of work distribution uh, follows a large deviation form. Okay. And if it does that, then the rate function is going to be related to this f of u in the following form. Okay. So that's the expression. So now. Uh, let me just show these two results very quickly. The first is that if I evaluate this at u equal to 0, so if I evaluate this derivative at u equal to 0, what I find is that this is just this quantity, q. So there is a solution of this equation where u w is 0 and w bar is q. So essentially i of q out here must be f of 0, and we know that f of 0 is 0. So evaluated at the residual energy, the rate function must go to 0. And this is because for a periodic drive, the rate function and the, uh, sorry, the average work and the residual energy coincides. Okay. The second thing, which is a more interesting thing, is that if I evaluate this, um, uh, if I want to find out the solution of uh, this equation for w bar equal to 0, then I find that the solution is u bar approaching infinity. And then i naught is f infinity, which is log of mod c naught square. So this, is, this relation relates the rate function to the wave function overlap square. Okay. Now how do we relate this to ND? Now what we do is that we basically, so let's first do this for integrable models and where it's really easy to see. And what we find there is that um, you know, the state at the end of the drive can be written in terms of single particle state where j is the many body index and sum over i is the number of single particle configuration for each j that you have. And then it is easy to see that <coughs> if you choose the appropriate basis, you can choose the ground state wave function to be uh, just n1. And therefore, mod c naught square is just d1j mod square for each j, and which can be written as 1 minus pj, where pj is just the sum over probability of being in the excited state. So Pj denotes the excitation probability. And in case of integrable system, this means that Pj denotes the probability that an excitation is formed with the index j. j could be a momentum, so for translation invariant system. And this tells you that I0 is greater than Nd. Uh, this is a simple piece of math that one is there, one has. So let me now apply this to in the last few minutes that I have, let me just apply this to uh, uh, examples of integrable models, again Ising and Kitaev. So here is the Ising model, which by John Wigner goes to this form, and this is something that most of you know. I'm not going to get into the details. 
But the thing is that we choose a drive protocol lambda t, which is periodic, so that the system starts from the paramagnetic phase and goes back to the ferromagnet. Okay. Uh, so, okay. So what we uh, so in this language, essentially, n one is the just the ground state, starting ground state, and uh, n two is the excited state for each k. Okay. So that's the relation of this notation with the earlier one, and k is just j in the earlier this thing. So the state after a period of the drive is given by that. It can be expanded in this 0 and 1 basis. And then I can sort of solve this equation. And then compute the wave function overlap. Okay. And mod c naught square is just pi alpha k square. And from this, it's easy to compute this uh, stuff. Okay. Both the uh, both the rate function and the Stuckelberg uh, and the Laplace the coefficient of exponent of the Laplace transform. So one can do this, and then one can actually check. You know, uh, so first of all, this is the computation of the rate function for the Ising model, and then one can actually check whether these things hold. So we compute this n of d in the Ising model separately, uh, and then compare it to I zero, and we find that it's always less than I zero. And the other thing is that we compute Q. Uh, separately, which is this red line, that's a direct calculation of Q, and the black dots are obtained by solution of I W equal to zero. Okay, and so you see that they really fall on top of each other, which gives you the second uh, this thing. So measurement of residual energy is a difficult thing. However, there are some. I'm not going to have time to get into that, but there are some experimental proposals for uh, calculating the uh, for measuring the characteristic function, and from there constructing the wave function. This might be a good way of getting Q out of this. So although I didn't talk about it, but similar things happen for the d equal to 2 kita model, where the only difference is that the system passes through a gapless line instead of a gapless point, and so uh, this difference is uh, increases, actually, because more excitations are formed. And finally, I would like to relate this um, periodic oscillation of IW to something called Stuckelberg interference. So. So it turns out that this analytical solution of these two-level systems uh, there can be, is possible within some adiabatic impulse approximation again. So what happens is that uh, there uh, the uh, the sort of the approximation is that all the excitations that are formed happens when the system passes through the critical point, and apart from that, the system just gathers an adiabatic phase factor for the rest of the drive. Okay. Now, if you do this, and if you sort of see that the system passes through this uh, gapless phase twice, uh, using this, you can sort of develop a transfer matrix formalism, which allows you to solve for this uh, probability of excitation formation for any k. And that's given by this. The first part of this p of k is just the probability that an excitation is produced because of the first passage to the critical point. Okay. This but however, there is an extra phase factor here, which is called the Stuckelberg phase, and which is a combination of the adiabatic phase that the system picks up between two passages through the critical point, and something called a Stokes phase, which is the phase that the system picks up while being at the critical point. Now, this Stuckelberg phase physically originates out of the interference of the wave function, uh, parts between parts of the system wave function at ground and excited state for each k, okay. because you know, once it first passes to a critical point, it starts at the ground state, first passes to a critical point, it branches off to two separate states, and then while coming back, these two branches interfere among each other. Okay. And that gives rise to this phase. And so the pro so this so all of this phi S T P K etc depends on the drive rate. So if we choose the drive rate where P of K goes close to half and phi K goes close to pi by two at the same K then gamma k square is large, and so is its integral. But if I choose another one where these two goes at, uh, so pk doesn't go to half at the same value of k for which phi kst goes to pi by 2, then uh, this p of k remains small. And therefore, in one case, you have a large gamma k. In the other case, you have a small gamma k. And in between, there is an oscillatory dependence. Okay? Because phi, phi of, so because there is a sine function here. It's very simple. So essentially, this is what leads to the oscillatory dependence of the work distribution. And this is one example where a quantum interference phenomenon 
influences a thermodynamic quantity like the work distribution. Okay. So, we do have a generic proof for relating I naught to N D for non-integrable system, but I am not going to bore you with this. So, let me just conclude. So, uh, the work statistics for any periodic system, uh, any given uh, periodic system obeys a large deviation principle and is always characterized by a rate function. It is possible to relate this rest function to residual energy and defect density for any periodically driven closed quantum system. So, that is the main point of the work. This is not possible for other drive protocols like a ramp or a quench for which people have done other studies. Now, for our class of quantum integrable model where the drive takes the system through a critical point, the work statistics becomes an oscillatory function of the drive frequency which can be related to Stuckelberg interference phenomenon. And this results can possibly be checked by measuring the characteristic function of quantum um, systems. Now, there are some experimental proposals, but whether or not they really could get this periodic drive is an issue. But if they can, then one can check this by constructing the work distribution and then relating it to ND and Q. Okay, so, thank you for your attention. Thanks, Kristendu. So, the session is now open for few uh, quick questions or comments. Yeah. So normally, in a, like uh, non-equilibrium systems, when one looks at this work distribution, I mean, so at least I, I mean, in lot of the work, the work, the rate function is defined as p of w is equal to exponential of tau times h, uh, like the h of w by tau, i of w by tau. Right. So and there, I mean, one can understand the large division principle because it's like a sum of random numbers. Mm. I mean, roughly. Yeah, sure. But here, I mean, uh, is it? It's not clear the way you define the rate function. It's not clear. It should actually satisfy always. Uh, no, because l to the power d is a large number, right? In a but it's not. Uh, okay, but uh, it's not this. Uh, so in the thermodynamic limit, this l to the power d is always a large number, and it, uh, that's what gives you that large number stuff. You know, large tau. That's equivalent to the large tau part. So of course, if you take a single spin or one particle, this is not going to be satisfied, but in the thermodynamic limit, it is probably going to be okay. But typically, at least in uh, the kind of systems uh, like uh, where it is discussed in the context of these fluctuation theorems and, mm. and so on, there is defined as uh, tau times, uh, so tau can be large. Uh, tau is tau, what? Tau is, is the time, like the 0 to tau, you drive it for time tau. Oh, but that is not actually, th that is. Okay, that is one way of defining it, but that is not really necessary. What is necessary is that uh, the exponent would have a large factor, you know. And uh, so, for example, in the earlier works on quench and ramp protocols for work distribution, this was the definition that was used, uh, not with tau. So, for example, you know, if you are studying, see, so there is a problem with defining it with tau because if you are studying a quench, for example, tau is zero. But nevertheless, there exists a work distribution and that does satisfy large deviation principle. And what one does is to define it through this, uh, use the largeness of the system volume to define the work distribution. So it is not necessary that if you have a fast enough drive, there would be no uh, periodic, uh, this thing. I mean, there would be no large deviation principle. It is really a matter of definition, we just choose this. No, I am just saying in the context at least of fluctuation theorems and so on, there mm. it is typically the rate function defined that way would define, uh, no, would okay. satisfy. Uh, yeah. Any more questions, comments? Okay, okay. Uh, if there are no more questions, let us move to the next talk and let us thank Christian again. Thank you.